Good afternoon and welcome to the Tuesday, August 30th, 2022 Public Works Committee meeting. Now is time for a roll call, roll call and determination of quorum. Here. Thank you. Now is time for adoption of the agenda. I have a motion, motion by Councilman Lehman, a second by Councilman Evans. All in favor? All opposed, motion passes. Now it's time for general public comment. This is a time for members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the committee on any issue not limited to items on the agenda. Action will not be taken at the meeting on any issue not on the agenda except by placement on the agenda by unanimous vote of the council members present I don't have any general public comments in front of me. If there's anybody from the audience that would like to speak about anything, let me know. If not, I'll open and close general public comment. We'll move on to consent items, items one through 16, and I will open the floor to our public works director. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am going to speak on items two through 13 with the exception of item eight. Uh, director uh, Fisher will address that item. Um, I'll get started. Item number two is a change order, uh, final change order for the West Omaha Street Utility Project. Um, a decrease amount there. Item number three is a fairly significant change order for our uh, Deadwood Avenue project that is ongoing right now. We've encountered uh, a lot of rock that was not anticipated as part of the project. Um, item number four is a final, or it's not a final, it's a change order in a very minor amount. I believe there was uh, uh, just some administrative changes in there for some water line and uh, I think part of a retaining wall uh, field change. Uh, item number five is a final change order for the St. Louis Street project. Uh, once again, a fairly minor amount. Uh, work was added, so that's value added. Uh, work on the contract. Uh, item number six is a change order, uh, and this is kind of fascinating. We um, had an issue, I think I brought this to you a month or so ago, uh, regarding our well 11 uh, with an emergency uh, procurement. Um, we have worked uh, with Lane Christensen. We had anticipated at that time that uh, we'd get the well replaced sometime in mid-October. Uh, due to their diligence, um, we're going to have that pump replaced by the end of this week, so nearly six weeks ahead of time. Um, so that's uh, part of the purpose of this change order is for that expedience and getting our redundancy back in our water system. So um, great news. And um, item number seven is to authorize uh, for bidding the St. Pat reconstruction project from uh, West I'm sorry, um, Mount Rushmore Road to 5th Street. And item number nine is a, an amendment to a bridge agreement that we assigned. Uh, typically our cost sharing for bridge projects is roughly 82% state or federal funding and 18% local funding. Um, we are actually receiving a bigger portion of federal funds on this project so that our state or I'm sorry our local match is only about four and a half five percent uh, so we were able to uh, leverage more state and federal funds so that's a good news uh, item number 10 is a uh, professional services amendment it's a time extension uh, amendment only no cost uh, item 11 is an exception for 40 dwelling unit on Cloud Peak Drive, which is, I believe is out in the High Point Ranch. Uh, Red Rocks area staff's recommendation is to approve. Um, item 12 is a sidewalk variance request. Once again, um, along Moon Meadows Drive, it's a uh, rural section, uh, no sidewalks anywhere near the area. Uh, once again, staff's recommendation is to approve. And item 13 is a purchase off of uh, source well contract for a, um, it's actually a used piece of equipment, a dozer uh, to be utilized out at uh, the landfill. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back to Director Fisher for item number eight. Mr. Chair, item number eight is a request advertising authority for block 75. That's the city's parking structure located just south of this parcel. Um, the 
renovation and maintenance of the three-level parking structure include structural, mechanical, electrical, and tower renovation. The total bill for that is $3.94 million. We did take this item before the Historic Preservation Committee. They unanimously approved the design and concept of the plan. Our recommendation today is that you approve contingent upon approval of the funding source. And at tomorrow's Legal and Finance Committee meeting, we'll have that funding source identified and brought forward for approval at that meeting. Thank you. Any questions on any of these items? Go ahead, Councilman. Well, I'm just kind of curious as to what all on this uh, parking ramp, um, that's a huge sum of money and I know there's problems over there. Um, there's other problems even with just um, the way the thing is sort of monitored. I know when I come uh, for dinner sometimes, you will find these people hot rotting up and down those ramps. It especially happens during hail season when people hide their cars and then they have little drag races in there. Who do we have that monitors that? I know we have somebody hired that is in charge of that now who I've never spoken with. But that's a concern. I'm worried that somebody's going to be run over sometime. I mean, what is uh, so answer to two questions there? Mr. Chair? Go ahead. So, uh, yes, we too feel the frustration of the drag racing that goes on in the parking structure. Uh, some of you may recall after one of our meetings, we were all standing outside and witnessed just screeching of tires and a young person screaming out of the parking structure. We do have cameras. Anna Gilligan is our parking enforcement division manager. Anna is in the audience today and is doing a super job, but it's very difficult to watch those cameras and, and find and read license plates. The police monitor it on a regular basis, but we're taking a step further. We've reached out uh, to different security companies in town to see about entering into a contract to have it monitored for us during those peak hours when we have, especially the young people, unsupervised racing through the garage. Um, and again, the police have been extremely helpful in um, being there for us if we can catch them and following through if we can get a license plate. Uh, we are also setting up uh, regular meetings with the uh, managers of Alex Johnson. Most of those that are in, that are drag racing, it appears, are associated with the parking for Alex Johnson. And we believe if we can create a relationship between the young valets and our parking enforcement officers, maybe just realizing that you're accountable for your actions, that will assist to some degree. Obviously, it's not the only issue, um, but there is some contribution uh, from that source. So again, just trying to improve security and keeping eyes wide open on that situation. Mr. Chair, we have the engineer and the architect in the audience today that the city has hired to bring this proposal forward. And uh, Stefan with Alberts Engineering has put together a brief presentation. With your permission, he would like to show it to this group. Thank you. Stefan? Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Stefan Kilber. I'm a licensed structural engineer here uh, with Albertson Engineering in Rapid City. Uh, Gene Fennell, the project architect, is also here to help field questions in regards to anything that may come up for the proposed stair enclosures as part of this project. I want to jump back in time just a little bit. The site of the current parking garage was originally a parking lot. Back in 1998, the first level of the garage was constructed. In 2008, the second and final level of the garage was uh, constructed. That was completed in January 2009. Main Street Square was finished in 2011, which has several support and maintenance buildings that are essentially constructed underneath or inside the footprint of the Block 75 parking garage. The next few slides, as we look at them, we need to be thinking about three things. Corrosion, corrosion, corrosion. 
The primary culprits for the corrosion are water from the environment and then also salts and de-icing agents that are used in the winter seasons to help mitigate slippery surfaces inside the garage. That left-hand photo is actually a picture of the underside of the driving deck on second floor on the Main Street square side where moisture and those de-icing salts have essentially sat on the deck and have permeated all the way through the deck thickness. So we have efflorescence, that's that snowy white, uh, surface deterioration of the concrete itself. There is also corrosion of the internal reinforcement. The right hand picture shows an image of, the, uh, of a spandrel which is essentially an, a precast concrete edge girder on the ramp side where moisture has penetrated inside the concrete caused the internal reinforcement to begin to deteriorate which has led to the spalling of the concrete exposing that reinforcement to the potential for more interaction with environmental moisture. A couple more pictures for uh, structural deterioration. The left-hand side is what we've been calling a sandwich plate joint. During the original construction of the garage, there were connectors on this joint between the double T's that were not installed appropriately. And so these sandwich plates were installed above and below the joint to mitigate that movement. However, if you've ever been in the garage and you've heard a loud clunk or a kachink sound, that's a vehicle driving over this joint. Those sandwich plates are not actually uh, mitigating movement there along for the ride and that excessive movement is uh, quickly deteriorating the joint sealant at this line and as you can see in that picture we have some moisture that is running down on the underside of the double T which is not where we want it. The final structural picture is a precast column located at the southeast uh, corner stairwell where again moisture has infiltrated the concrete begun the uh, corrosion of the internal reinforcement and then we now have a pretty significant that spall is actually about four feet in height and it's pretty noticeable if you're anywhere near that stairwell. Mechanically we have the same thing. Uh, we have corrosion on the left and right pictures of uh, almost all of the vertical drain piping to some extent throughout the entire footprint of the garage. That center picture is an image of drains that were installed in 2013 to help mitigate and remove standing water However, they were not sized appropriately, they're now plugged, so instead of draining moisture, they actually encourage moisture to stay on the surface of the concrete, leading to some of the deterioration that we saw in the preceding slides. Electrically, we're in the exact same boat as the other two areas for this structure. The center and right pictures are of the primary metal panel that houses the, uh, it's the metal cabinet that houses the electrical panel and the primary switch gear. As you, the right hand picture shows corrosion not only in the panel itself, but also the primary switch box. That left hand picture, uh, it kind of looks like a part of the garage went and took a dive down to the Titanic and stayed down there a little too long. Uh, it shows not only corro significant corrosion on conduit in the lower left corner, there is significant deterioration of a vertical standpipe. And right kind of dead center is a section of precast deck that is actually spalled away to the point that there's really only about two inches of concrete left at that point. It is not a safety concern at this point, but it's reasons like this we are encouraging uh, these repairs as part of this upcoming project. We're going to switch gears and uh, look primarily at the stairs here for just a little bit. Left hand side shows light to moderate uh, surface deterioration, uh, rust on the bar grating that is present from the main level, the first level of the garage up to second. The center picture shows sections of concrete for the stair treads that the internal reinforcement has begun to deteriorate and corrode, essentially heaving and expanding that concrete out of position, making for uneven and unlevel walking surfaces. In the right hand side we see uh, more significant structural uh, steel deterioration known as rust pitting where moisture actually gets inside the paint and uh, is held there to deteriorate the steel on a more long term basis. This slide does a couple different things. One, the left hand picture shows us what the new stairs would have looked like back in 1998 during the original construction. This picture was taken over at the Pennington County stairs a couple weeks ago. It also shows us that in 2011, these stairs were constructed as part of that garage project. In 2013, the Pennington County uh, commissioners at the time decided to go ahead and enclose their stairwell. For the last 10 years, these stairs have been protected from the moisture and, and environmental issues and factors, and relatively speaking, they're in decent shape. 
So now if we jump to the center picture, which was taken in 2013, this was taken at the southeast stairwell. We have a couple treads with significant cracking in them. That internal reinforcement is already beginning to corrode, and the concrete is beginning to heave out of position. In 2013, there were topical efforts to try and remediate this, but as you can see, if we fast forward to right now today, those same treads, you can see that center uh, tread section has heaved up a probably, I'm going to say about an inch, inch and a half, creating a very uneven, um, almost rounded uh, walking surface that people have to traverse daily to get to and from their vehicles in the garage, making a potential trip hazard. Based on the last four or five slides, it's pretty obvious that there are significant repairs throughout the garage that need to be made. As part of those repairs, we are also, as a design team, encouraging that these stairways be enclosed, similar to what's present at the Pennington County uh, garage structure. The primary reason for this is we are looking to increase user safety by mitigating slips, trips, and falls. Pennington County in 2013, they were actually encouraged by their insurance provider to enclose the stairs to, again, increase that user safety by mitigating that potential for ice and snow buildup on the stairs for users. We're also looking, these, these enclosures will also provide better protection from the environment and they will extend the life of the stair repairs. As, as you saw in the preceding slide, some of those stairs are only 23 years old and they are in uh, disrepair, needing significant uh, TLC. We're also looking to reduce future maintenance in terms of snow and ice removal on the stairs. Um, we have a couple renderings here of both the southeast and southwest stairwell. Again, as Vicki pointed out, we have already taken these concepts uh, before historic preservation and we've received uh, their uh, approval in terms of this concept. Wanted to jump away from the renderings and now to go to a real life example. Uh, we have the southwest stair at block 75 compared to the stair at the Pennington County garage. I would encourage any and all of you to go to the corner of Kansas City and 2nd Street and look at this stairwell. Uh, it, it, it feels very open. There is really no place inside that stairwell where someone could hide or loiter that you as a user on the ground level wouldn't potentially be able to see. Here's the two same exact stairwells just taken at night. Uh, as part of our project, we are looking to do some lighting and electrical upgrades in the stairs to go away from that more yellow softish light to more of an LED-based lighting system similar to the Pennington County garage. And as a final slide, wanted to just go through what some of the costs were as part of this project. That slide, the first bullet point says structural repairs. Those are the estimated costs for just fixing the stairs at about $270,000 or 7% of the overall project. The proposed enclosures as shown in the drawings right now are estimated at about $390,000, which is roughly 10% of the overall cost. Thus, the combined cost between structural repairs and stair enclosures is 660,000, or only 17% of the overall project. Um, as you can see from the total bill, estimated cost on this from the design team, there's significant efforts both for other structural, mechanical, and electrical components to where we feel that the enclosures would potentially be a good sound investment um, to increase that user safety and also extend the life of the structure. And here's a couple more pictures because it's hard to sum up all the issues that are wrong in the garage structurally with just two slides. So please let us know if you have any questions. Any questions from anyone other than Bill? No, go ahead, Bill. You got the floor. Well, I'm glad to see that this is being addressed. I've been <clears throat> wondering when one of those panels was going to fall on my head, to be honest with you. I'm a little concerned with the original design in that it's been uh, damage as much by the weather. Um, for the last 45 or so years, I've been using about three different parking ramps in Lincoln when I travel down to football games. Most of them were constructed in the early 80s. I've been observing that none of this kind of damage has been seen, and so I'm a little worried about the original uh, design concept of this whole thing in the first place, and it hasn't aged very well. 
Um, even people have always questioned us about the ceiling heights in there and why are they so tall and why didn't you put in five levels rather than three in the same amount of space, that kind of stuff. But that's not <clears throat> the question. My concern is that um, we maybe don't do something that doesn't really mitigate the problem. We have the same problem in 15 or 20 years. And I would also comment there was such hysteria about making sure that this original ramp was matching the uh, architecture of the city, the overall you know, ornamentation, everything. And I, I don't find those enclosures to be particularly sympathetic uh, to what's there. And so maybe that needs to be looked at a little more before you decide to do that exact design. But I, I think this is all necessary to do and will solve a major problem that is uh, going to even become more, more major if one of these things falls in. So thank you. Go ahead, Vicki. Thank you. I, I think that Councilman Evans makes some great points. One of the things that we're most concerned of, too, is continued maintenance. Uh, in 2013, there was some work done on the parking structure, yet here we sit again. You saw the pictures that we're looking at today. One of the things that I, I can appreciate was brought to the table and a line item that I had to ask questions on was a sealant. A sealant that wasn't used initially that will be used now on those surface driving surfaces that will preserve that concrete so that we don't have that water infiltration and the corrosiveness that we're experiencing today. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, on the enclosures, I had had an opportunity to visit with some of you previously about some of the concerns with enclosing the stairwells. And we share those same concerns. Loitering is an issue in the downtown area. So some of the things that I wanted to point out on these stairwells is even though we're calling them enclosed, they're open. Uh, they're open at the top, they're open at the bottom, they're not heated, the wind will howl through there, it will be cold, they will be well lit. Uh, they are going to be transparent. And so the idea that people would loiter for any length of time or potentially want to um, make it a temporary housing situation is limited in nature. But if it does become a problem, we've done some research on um, loitering security systems, and we've found some that for a minimal cost serve a great purpose. And the one that I personally like the best, and we could certainly have that discussion if it's determined that we need it, is a system where um, it's, it's got cameras and lighting in it, and if someone goes into the stairwells and they become stationary for an X period of time, let's say 15 minutes, the lights will strobe and a siren will alarm until they get up and move. And uh, I heard an audio of it, and I don't think any of us would stick around if this thing went off. So there are, there are things that we could do that others have done in other cities where loitering can be an issue in that regard. I will point out that we did sit down with the architects for the uh, Historic Preservation Committee, and we went through the design of the enclosures, um, the size of the panels, um, went through the intricacies of the width of the framing, the colors. Um, Jean Fennell was uh, at that meeting, and so there was confirmation that looking at what we have today, this was the best fit for that structure, uh, but certainly we'll take comments on that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we're to the point now where Ms. Fisher mentioned some um, monitoring things that maybe work, but I wonder what we would uh, accomplish if we had somebody sitting in front of a, an array of cameras and paying them full time to watch different sites with two-way communication, who could actually sort of from one seat say, uh, you're not supposed to be there. Uh, if you're not out of there, uh, we can have you removed. Um, you're not supposed to be dumping those things into our garbage collection things, they don't fit it. I mean, I would think this is something we could set up and it would be really cost effective over the, over the course of many years and saving money and it could be manned by one person even to do that sort of thing. And I don't know if some system like that exists. I know my own home camera system, I can yell at somebody if they don't want them in the yard. And maybe that's something we need to look at. Um, for places like the band shelf or places like downtown corners and whatnot. I, it's just an idea to throw out there. Thanks. Mr. Chair, if I might. So um, I sit on a, a, a committee at, in the city uh, for security for this building. And uh, police, we had a police officer join us not too long ago. And it came to our attention 
that there are cameras throughout the city that are monitored by the police department. We talked about cameras in this building, cameras that are currently existing in the parking structure, and monitoring is always an issue. And so that, there are ongoing discussions right now about the importance of having eyes on camera to really make them serve the purpose that they're intended to serve. Thank you. If we don't have any more questions. No, no. Now we're moving on to items from Park and Recreation if you don't have any uh, other questions. Go ahead, Mr. Bigler. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two items on today's agenda. Uh, the first is a joint powers agreement uh, between the city and the South Dakota Game Fish and Parks to assist us with a Canyon Lake Park pond wall project, replacing those deteriorating uh, stone walls around the small ponds and raceways inside Canyon Lake Park. Uh, the the agreement would uh, uh, actually uh, have the uh, the state participate uh, just at just over 50 percent of the project, which is awesome. Uh, they were eager to get involved because uh, the improvements there will uh, benefit the, the fish habitat. Uh, we'll be deepening those uh, ponds just enough uh, to increase flow and to make them more habitable to fish species. Also, it, it would uh, increase the uh, accessibility uh, for fishing opportunities at these ponds. A lot of people go into the park to fish, um, and this project would, uh, would add some uh, uh, concrete walkways uh, in small areas where um, someone in a wheelchair or stroller could get there and, uh, and enjoy those ponds. So that's the first project. Uh, the second item is a, 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 a professional services agreement for construction administration on our large uh, dinosaur park project, which will be kicking off later this fall. Uh, and those are the two items we have. Do you have any questions on either of these two items? Me again. <laughs> and I'm familiar with your uh, wall reconstruction project and the attention to detail it's good, and it's probably a good thing. However, my one concern is that most of these rock walls were those original WPA constructions, I mean, back from the U and Youth Conversa Conservation Corps, or whatever, and they were done um, really early on, a lot of them. And my only concern is that we're tearing out somewhat historical things in some cases and replacing them with things that are not. And I might be wrong about those walls in Canyon Lake because they may be reconstructed much later. And I just want to make sure that if there's any historical ones, it's kind of like putting for Mike on the resolute desk in the White House. Yeah, it'll work better and probably 90% of the people wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but it's not the same. Um, has that all been looked at? Uh, yes, it has. Uh, our our uh uh, designer has met with uh, with Sarah Hansel, who's been uh, intimately involved with historical uh, uh, issues here in Ra in Rapid City, and uh, they agree that the the pond walls themselves are not uh, as historical as as perhaps the wall that uh, kind of lines the the entrance of the park, uh, because those have been replaced uh, over the years uh, after the flood. They were they were wiped out and then rebuilt. Uh, so they are not of historical nature, and so uh, as a as historical matter, that is not an issue to the historical uh, group here in town. Yeah, I just, you know, I worry about these things because a big feature of East Boulevard, for those of us who grew up here, were the lagoons that lined East Boulevard, and it was part of that same design, and it was really quite beautiful, and there were remnants of those um, rock walls even up to this last reconstruction. But when I was a kid, water used to flow along East Boulevard into lagoons similar to Canyon Lake Park, and those of us who are old enough to remember that, it was really quite lovely. And somebody decided that was not worth preserving. I don't think that was an improvement to the city, and it's unfortunate that wasn't re rebuilt in the last reconstruction because there's definitely room for it. Now it's just sort of a wasteland. But that was all off to the west side of East Boulevard. And uh, we need to be cognizant of what our city assets are and preserving the ones that are important, um, similar to what we're hopefully doing up at Dinosaur Park and saving as much as we can, even if we address the issues those have. So thank you. Thank you. If we don't have any more questions on any of these items, I'll look for 
Um, look. Yeah, but I'd, I'm not going to read it in. Do you want me to? Do you want to read it in? There, the mayor's not here. We always skip them. We have a motion to approve. Who's this? And a second. So we have a motion to approve by Councilman Evans, a second by Councilman Lehman. All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. On to uh, non consent items, items 17. I will open public comment. I do have one speaker on public comment, uh, Dane Boomsma. Give us your name and. Dane Boomsma with Boom Construction. Um, I was <coughs> fortunate enough to be on the IAG, the Infrastructure Advisory Group, that uh, Ted Johnson, from my understanding, helped establish uh, right prior to his retirement. Um, I'm actually on the group representing the Black Hills Home Builders Association. Uh, obviously, I've got a lot of business in the community, so I have a lot of motivation to see these specs updated that were back from 2007, I believe. Um, in my experience, this is the first group that I feel like we're actually going to see through, that we set an objective up front, a goal, um, and we're going to get there. Um, it wasn't through negotiations or compromise on both parties, meaning the public and members as well as city staff. So first and foremost, I appreciate the process. I'm glad that it was brought from the city to the public to have a group like this put together. Um, I hope that it's a continued effort. I hope that it's a continued review process, which has been talked about amongst city staff, that that's going to be part of the IAG moving forward, that there is a review plan and process so we're not 15 years behind on specs or design criteria. That all being said, I've been pretty adamant about us also addressing the IDCM. So in my world, contractor world, we have a spec manual, which is on the agenda today, and we also have the IDCM. There was contra contradicting information in the current spec from 2007 between the spec manual and IDCM, um, amongst many updates that needed to be done that we addressed in the spec. Adopting the new spec manual needs to happen. There's a lot of things that I've been fighting for in there. For example, and I'll just put it on record, HDPE. We've been fighting for that plastic pipe, I don't even know, 10 years, and that's in the spec manual. So huge win in my part, been a long time coming. So I, as much as anybody want to see that spec manual adopted, the review process of the spec manual took too long. Like I said, that was Ted Johnson retired 1st of January 2021 if my memory serves me right. So we're nearing two years that we've been trying to do this review process. What I fear is that we have another two years in the IDCM. Now, every time we want to update a spec, it's a four-year process. That, to me, is unacceptable to what we should be able to do. I've asked the staff that's a part of the group, and I, I was very upfront and clear. I don't know if many of you know me very well, but you pretty much know what I'm thinking. And I asked them for dates. I said, I will support the spec manual being approved, but I want dates for the IDCM, and I want to be held to them. And for the most part, the review of the spec manual, there were a couple long periods of time, and again, I don't know staff's backdoor or what they do daily, so I'm sure they're overworked like everybody is, but there were a couple period of time where we weren't meeting, we weren't reviewing stuff. Cut those out, and the review process, in my opinion, was a reasonable amount of time outside of a couple of legs there. Um, so. I ask that we encourage staff to commit to some timelines and some monthly meetings. That's what we were meeting was monthly. And commit to something that we can expect back. You guys as, as uh, committee members can expect reports back on that IDC, IDCM because that IDCM is just as important as this spec manual to get adopted. So in conjunction, they meet, they, they marry together well. We're updated from 2007 to 2022, not 22 and 24. So that's what I ask you encourage staff to do. All in all, this spec manual is great. It's a great progress, what we needed, and we hope to not wait 15 years for the next review. That's all I got. 
Thank you. I will read this in and then I'm sure we'll have a few questions for you. Uh, item 17, uh, approve, approve resolution number 2022-072, resolution adopting the standard specifications for public works construction 2022 edition. Um, Mr. Tech. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe we've got a short presentation to give um, on this item, so if you would bear with us, we'd uh, uh, I'd like to introduce Michelle Lashley. She's our uh, design group coordinator in our engineering department. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, there we go. Uh, so yeah, this is the 2022 edition of the standard specifications for public works construction. Um, I would like to point out that this has been <clears throat> an effort by a large group of people, including nearly all of the uh, design group staff, um, people from the construction group, utility maintenance, um, other parts of public works. It also included uh, coordination with the AGC and like Dane mentioned, the IAG, which is an advisory group that was put together to review these specifications. So that included uh, contract, uh, contractors, engineers from the community, suppliers, uh, private utilities, and also uh, we had representation from city council on there. Uh, in general, the specs uh, have some major uh, components that I'm gonna talk about. The first one is that the specifications included um, a large amount of references to DOT specs. So the local contractors are used to working with the DOT specifications. So where we could, we incorporated uh, things that the DOT is already doing in their specs um, and uh, our local contractors are used to doing. So not big changes in how work is done, but changes in how we implement them. <coughs> We deleted some unused sections of our specs. Uh, we combined sections that, where it made sense to have them put together. And we've got some new sections that are based on some new technologies that are being used in the industry today. We've also updated our material list since 2007. Many of them were outdated. Some manufacturers were no longer even in business. So we, we have made those updates. Uh, we considered input from local manufacturers, designers, suppliers, um, contractors as, as part of specs. And like I said, we updated uh, some specs to current indus industry standards. And this was a collaborative effort between the city and many stakeholders in the community. One of the huge changes that was incorporated is the uh, section eight. So currently section eight wa is uh, water piping. We broke that into two sections. The first section is basically what our existing section eight is. We call it 8A now and that's um, different materials that are used uh, in the water system from fittings to pipelines. And as Dane mentioned, the incorporation of HDPE as an allowable product for service lines was incorporated into the specs. Uh, another big item is the corrosion protection. The city has been using the corrosion protection specifications uh, since even before 2014, like it says on the slide, um, on city funded projects, but now this is a requirement for development contractors to use as well. And a lot of them have also been using it, um, but it just hasn't been in our specs as an adopted item. <clears throat> Section nine is sanitary sewer. Uh, some updates here again, we updated suppliers and materials. Um, we added the requirement for uh, televising sewer mains to be done by a contractor uh, rather than city crews doing that work. We increased the minimum slope of service lines to be consistent with the building code, and uh, we're requiring the use of inline T's as a connection point to our sewer mains. So that um, is, a, is a big improvement over what we're currently doing or what we were doing, which allows the intrusion of uh, infiltration into our system. So, you know, causing areas where we can treat stormwater um, in the sewer, which is not a good thing. So, you know, eliminating that access point. Um, we updated our uh, section 11, which is our backfill section, uh, added the bedding requirements for HDPE service lines. Uh, we added recycled asphalt 
um, paving into our, uh, into our specs. So this has been something that we've been allowing with the use of exceptions for many years now. This is recycled material that will allow, allow in the bottom lift of uh, re reconstruction streets and new streets. Um, we're allowing precast drop inlets into our storm sewer system. This is also another thing that the contractors have been asking for for many years. And then we updated our construction staking section. <clears throat> we added machine controlled grading as, uh, as an allowable way to uh, grade projects. So this is, you know, again, new technology that's being incorporated into our specs using GPS and uh, on, on the graders themselves. We added a submittal section to standardize the submittals that we received. We're going to allow electronic submittals, so moving into current times. And again, we added that televising spec. The resolution in front of you also presents a framework for future updates. Um, it will allow future updates to be reviewed by the infrastructure advisory group and then uh, approved by the public works director so that we can make updates as they're needed administratively and not, uh, not necessarily have to bring them in front of the council for approval. So, um, that's, just, go ahead. Uh, Chairman Roberts, if I may, just, uh, I'd really like to recognize some people. Michelle has read every line of the specification and the book's about that thick. There's some other people here in the audience that should be recognized too. Dane has also read every line, I think. Uh, Mike Wilkening. We've also got uh, Sarah Auden, uh, one of our engineers, Nicole Lisi, uh, Morgan Falcone. Carla has read almost the whole thing. And then in this, uh, Brandon's sitting there and uh, Mike Wilkening is back there also and they've done a huge lift on this thing. Uh, in the other row here, we've got some really smart people. Uh, Dustin with HDR has been instrumental. Uh, Jason Pettyjohn with FMG. And then, of course, Dane already spoke. And it, this would not have gotten done without their work. Uh, Richie Nordstrom has also been to almost every meeting that we've had. And it's, it's, been, it's been incredible to see what these guys have done in the last couple of years to get this project moving along. Like Dan said, we had some spits and spurts, but it's, it's, a, it's an incredible effort. And a lot of it rests with Michelle and her leadership getting this done. So I want to thank you. Thank you. And since you're there, can I ask you a quick question? <laughs> So what's the timeline for setting up the review of the IDCM? IDCM, I knew. Dane warned me about this. Uh, uh, I've promised him given dates. So far, I've given him the 30th of February and the 32nd of August. Uh, no, we will have that done here uh, shortly. I'm still, I wanted to get this one put to bed and then set a timeline for the next one. And I can't sit here. We haven't met as a group yet to put that together. It will not take the 15 years that this took. I'll guarantee it. If I had a dollar for every time I was told that. Uh, I will guarantee <laughs> That's it. That's why I want a timeline set in stone. Set so in stone? I'm not going to give you that. Within the next 30 days, I'd like to have a timeline set I'll, for this. We'll put together a timeline. But I, I, I don't want to sit here and commit to something. I don't have a full scope of what we have to review and everything yet. Uh, uh, still, I'm going to play the I'm new here card. I, I haven't even read the IDCM yet as it stands now. Uh, these guys assure me that we're moving along. Uh, well, if we set it up in 30 to 45 days, it gives you plenty of time to read it. <laughs> yes, you, you are correct, and, uh, but we'll get you a timeline, and uh, I'll get that out to uh, you, and then uh, we, we'll share it with everybody. But, uh, but I want to coordinate that with these guys, too. Oh, absolutely. I, mean, uh, I don't want to impact their schedule, and right now we're in summer. It's the heat of battle out there in the, in the construction world and uh, you know, as we go forward. She also mentioned that we just got in the comments from Black and Beach or Black and Beach on the water. So, you know, we're taking input from a lot of sources, but we will get you a timeline. It will not take 15 years. Uh, I expect it to not take <laughs> three months. Well, it, 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 it might take before little, it starts. Okay, okay. Before <laughs> it starts. Thank you for that negotiation. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we're going to get on that next, and, and we promise that. There's some other things that go along with this. We have some drafting standards that go along with this, that so we get uniform-looking plans out for the city and some other things. So it, it's it's a huge. But you know, without these people sitting out of here, this this would not have been done. Uh, I can honestly tell you that even before, I've been working on this since uh, 2000. 
So it even goes back farther than that. And I still have my book from when I was with the AGC on all the changes and improvements that have gone into the specs. And I was one of those guys on the other side of the game. I was always a pain, but it, we, we, we've got some cool things working. And uh, I, I appreciate your guys' support in this whole effort. So. And I believe there's a lot of good things that were in here. I didn't read the whole thing, but I read through it some. Uh, there was some things that we've been looking forward to and people have been fighting for for many years. So I'm happy to see some of the things that have changed in here. So maybe Rapid City within the next, you know, decade will get into the 20th century. So anyway, I'm very, very excited about some of the things that are happening. I'm yeah. being a little facetious. So. No, no, I understand. And I do want to make a, a comment. A lot of these things, and, and I'll just show an example that uh, Michelle pointed out, these precast inlets, that one item alone is a huge time savings out there for the contractor rather than have to lay a storm sewer up to an inlet and then cast the inlet in place and do everything else. But that one thing, uh, we do have some criteria on installation, so we're still protecting our infrastructure. But that, that a typical inlet could take you anywhere from three to seven days on a project. That's a huge slowdown. Whereas now these precast ones, you can set them in place in about a half a day. So, you know, we're trying to work with the contractor to make sure that we're getting a good quality product, but also allowing them the time to complete the projects. <coughs> and then, like I said, this HDPE thing was a big thing. So, like I said, we appreciate your help. And I look forward to the day that the city starts using it on their projects, too. So, anyway. Well, that's part of these specs. We will be. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Any questions from? A couple comments, if I could. You may. First of all, um, I'm going to ask Mr. Boomsma to give me a call or hang around and talk about some of those concerns you had. I'd like to know what they are. Uh, question for, first of all, there's no requirement that city government or any government has to move at a snail's pace because, uh, let's face it, the private um, enterprise people they understand that time is money and uh, you know and I hear some of these things is going to take a year well why don't we do it in two weeks I mean I'm serious about these things that we you know we can actually work past four o'clock some of these times and get the stuff done so people can move ahead um, back to that one um, you had improvement there concerning corrosion and plastic fittings um, what kind of corrosion are those things actually sub subject to? I thought we only really had trouble with corrosion where it met another. Uh, no, we use me we use metallic fittings, and it's okay. So they are metallic fittings. fittings. Yep. yep. And are the uh, plastic fittings not suitable there? In certain cases, we use plastic fittings as well. It depends on the size of the pipe and the use. Okay. And then the only other question I have for you is what I always ask you: Have you been practicing your cello? I have not. <laughs> All right. Come on. <laughs> I was going to start with that, but <laughs> <laughs> if we have no other questions, I'll be looking for a motion. Oh, item 17, we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? We have a second, so we have a motion to approve by, Ms. by Councilman Evans, a second by Councilman Ham. I think that's the first time I've heard you say something, so I'm impressed. So. All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, motion passes. I have a motion to adjourn and a second. All in favor? Thank you very much. Great meeting.